Hey there, 1302 students, and welcome back. So this week we're going to talk about one thing that I absolutely love talking about, which is the Progressive Era. So the Progressive Era um, was a time period in American history in which they were solving the issues of the Gilded Age. And so there were all kinds of issues in the Gilded Age, right? So um, the massive difference gap between the rich and the poor, um, and, and that, of course, created a lot of poverty. It created the tenements, which we talked about last time, and things like that. Um, and of course, this is really because the influx of immigrants that come into the country, no place to put them. Uh, again, things that we've talked about the last couple of weeks. So the progressives are the people that come in and really fix these issues of the Gilded Age. And so that's what we're going to talk about in this lesson. So I hope you enjoy that. And also, there's some great clips that will go with this. And I highly encourage you to watch that too. Okay, so um, the term progressive itself basically, you know, is loosely defined as something that brings about significant change in American society, politics, economics. So the progressive people included businessmen who were like uh, deciding whether or not they, you know, to legitimize unions. Women reformers tend to be like the biggest part of this group, just like in the early 1800s, which you might remember from 1301. The women reformers are going to be the big, you know, middle class women reformers, really educated middle class women reformers leading the charge. And then there were also social scientists that just saw how badly things were looking in this time period and writing articles, making statements and speeches and things of that nature. Okay, so we know that this was an urban age, right? We know that the, the city, there was the growth of the city. The cities were becoming much more urbanized. The economy absolutely explodes. The population explodes because of the influx of immigrants that are coming in. But the other thing that also increases is consumer choice. Um, standard of living, quality of life increases because of all the inventions and innovations that happen for the first time. And even agriculture enters into this, like, you know, golden age. We start to see cities that actually have a large population or larger population for that time period. So during that time period, a large city was considered any city that was over like 100,000 people. And you can tell from this chart here how many um, of them were growing. So you can tell that in 1880, they only had 12 cities with 100,000. But, you know, by 1920, 26. So you can see that really grows a lot. Oops, I'm sorry. You can't probably see that last part there. Okay, um, and one thing for sure that we saw was the huge disparity between the rich and the poor. Mark Twain, like we talked about before, um, you know, he comes up with the term the Gilded Age because if you scratch the surface just a little bit, underneath you saw all the inequalities that were going on, right? So it looked really pretty and really opulent from the outside. But you just need to scratch the surface a little. And that's, and that's exactly what was happening and going on. So this is a picture. I love this image, this comparison here. But Cornelius Vanderbilt, he lived amongst other millionaires in Millionaire's Row in Fifth Avenue in New York City. And you go three miles to the south and you run into these tenements where people, they don't have indoor plumbing. They're dumping their stuff outside in the deck. Um, and, you know, it's absolutely disgusting. It's overcrowded. And so they're living in this this horrible living conditions with high infant mortality where, you know, three miles to the north, they're living in opulent, beautiful mansions. And so a lot of people start to really speak out about this, um, about this difference and this inequality that are going on. And these people are known as the muckrakers. So there's a really great video that explains where this term, the muckrakers, came from. Um, but essentially, the muckrakers, they were journalists that usually did, like, undercover investigative journalism. Like Nellie Bly, for example, um, she went underneath, or in, underneath, she went into um, an insane asylum. She had her publisher uh, bring her into the insane asylum and pretend like he was married to her so that she could talk about the conditions of the insane asylum. And she wrote a piece, um, 10 Days in a Madhouse, about that. So that is one example. Probably one of the most famous examples, and this is one that we talked about when we talked about the Gilded Age, was Jacob Reese and his photojournalist book, How the Other Half Lives. And so he was considered a muckraker. Okay, muckrakers are people that rake up the muck of society and expose everything that's happening, right? They're the ones that kind of take that. And Teddy Roosevelt, incidentally, is the one that came up with that term in a speech. And like I said, the video, you know, uh, does describe exactly why that was. So, you know, Upton Sinclair 
We're going to talk about him in detail. Your book, Chapter 6, goes into a lot of detail about um, the meatpacking industry and Upton Sinclair in particular. So, you know, I definitely encourage you to read that chapter and, and get more into depth into what exactly was happening there. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more, too. Okay, some of the other muckrakers include people like Lincoln Steffens from the Shame of the wrote the Shame of the Cities. Essentially, the political bosses, the people that were running the cities, like Boss Tweed of New York City, and really uncovering their corruption in the city themselves. Lewis Hine, very similar to uh, Jacob Rees, but his focus was on the plight of the child worker and get, bringing attention to child labor. And then you have a woman taking on Rockefeller in. Um, History of Standard Oil, Ida Tarbal, and so she takes on and exposes the ruthless methods that Rockefeller took, and a lot of the idea behind Rockefeller being such a ruthless person comes from Ida Tarbal's writings. Okay, so let's let's dig a little deeper into um, the jungle. I've got some clips here that I think um, are interesting, really kind of gross, but I lo always love to go over them. This kind of shows you, um, you know, the kind of journalism that they would do. And, uh, and I mean, this is from Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. So um, I just to preface this a little bit, my stepdaughter in her junior year in high school, she read uh, The Jungle as a uh, as a English um, assignment. So she read The Jungle. She was so disgusted by it that she ended up becoming a vegetarian. And she's like 29 and she's still a vegetarian. So that kind of tells you you know, um, the impact this book had, even, you know, in modern times. But this book is what is going to bring about the USDA, um, you know, the Food and Drug Administration, meat inspection. If you go to the store and you look and there's a sticker on your meat that says USDA inspected, that all comes because of Upton Sinclair's writing. So let me, uh, let me read a couple of these to you guys. So here's from Chapter 9. There were the men in the pickle rooms, for instance, where old antenna had gotten his death, scarce a, none of, a one of these that had not some spot of horror on his person. Let a man so much as scrape his finger, pushing a truck in the pickle rooms, and he might have a sore that would put him out of the world. All the joints in his fingers might have been eaten by the acid one by one, of the butchers and the floorsmen, the beef and the boners, and trimmers, and all of those who used knives. You could scarcely find a person who had the use of his thumb. Time and time again, the base of it had been slashed till it was a mere lump of flesh against which the man pressed a knife to hold. Pretty disgusting, I know. Okay, here's another one from Chapter 14. Under the system of rigid economy which the packers enforced, there were some jobs that only paid to do once in a long time, and among these was the cleaning out of waste barrels. Every spring they did it, and in the barrels would be dirt and rust and old nails and stale water, and cartload after cartload of it would be taken up and dumped into the hoppers uh, with fresh meat and sent off out to the public's breakfast. Yum. Does not sound good, right? Okay. And here's another one. There was never the least attention paid to what was cut up for sausage. There would come all the way back from Europe old sausage that had been rejected, and that was moldy and white, and it would be dosed, doused with borax and glycerin, and dumped into the hoppers, and made over and over again for home consumption. There would be meat that had tumbled out on the floor in the dirt and sawdust where the workers had trampled and spit. Uncounted billions of consumption germs. Yuck. Gross again here. Okay, let's look at our last little example here. And if that were not enough, there was a trap in the pipe where all the scraps of meats and odds and ends and refuse were caught. And every day, every few days, it was the old man's task to clean out and shovel their contents into one of the trucks with the rest of the meat. Okay, so anyway, well, I guess I, I was over that a little bit. Sorry about that. But anyway, so you get the idea. It's pretty disgusting. Um, Upton Sinclair, again, his writings lead to... The passage of the Meat Inspection Act in 1906 by Teddy Roosevelt. He actually reads it himself and is completely disgusted by it. And then, um, and also the Food and Drug Administration. So now they're going to take a closer look and, and provide consumer protection, which was one of the things that Teddy Roosevelt essentially made, wanted to make sure that he did. Okay, so here is um, an image of the plight of the child worker. So here are some images of the, of the child worker themselves. This is from Lewis Hines. 
um, you can see, you know, he tried to really show these children. A lot of them were actually older than what they looked, but their work in particular stunted their growth. And so he does that. And um, just like uh, Jacob Reese with How the Other Half Lives, Lewis Himes, he does this, The Plight of the Child Worker, to really show exactly what was going on with the child worker. Okay. Um, and so immigrant neighborhoods uh, lived into these areas called ethnic neighborhoods, or they were called enclaves. And they really do this because they live in these neighborhoods because, um, you know, people share the same similar religion as them and culture and language. And so they live into these little clusters of neighborhoods close by and close together. And here's a, um, an idea of what this looks like. So I think this is Chicago. And this, all these different colors, I know you can't see these, but all these different colors essentially were, um, what they were is were different ethnic groups, different from different places around the world. And you can see the percentage of their population that was immigrant to in these major cities. Okay, this is a census report, and I'm going to explain that one here in just a minute, because this is actually a census report from my family. This is from 1900, and what these census reports show is they show that all of the people that have similar cultures and languages are living close together in these little enclaves. And so here's the example um, of my, uh, you know, many of them live in these enclaves, of my great-great-grandfather. Let me show you this. So this is like over there. Um, it's right here. Here he is. But here's a blow-up of it. So Israel Manesevich from Russia. And this is my great-grandfather, Isidore or Izzy Manesevich. Now they changed their name. Actually, it, legally it was Maness when they went across Ellis Island. Their name was shortened. So um, th their last name is actually Maness. But you can see my, my great-great-grandmother was from Austria. My great-great-grandfather was from Russia. They're Jewish. And this even says what they do. But they're living amongst a lot of other Jews um, in this cluster here, too. Okay. So um, the last person that we're going to talk, well, actually, we're going to talk about a couple other things. But the last specific, uh, last specific progressive person we're going to talk about is Jane Addams and the Whole House. Okay. So Jane Addams um, is what she really founds the modern uh, social worker. Um, she's really considered America's first social worker, but her focus at that time was uh, the immigrant and, ha and allowing them to assimilate and acclimate into the American culture. And I know today assimilate is a, is a very negative thing, and I, and I totally get that because I come from an immigrant family. But Jane Addams, um, you know, at that time, that was really the way for them to really acclimate and become, you know, better part and more, more inc increment part of society itself. So in 1889, she creates something known as the Whole House. She models this out of, um, I think it was called Tonesby Hall in England, when she travels to England, and they have settlement houses there. And essentially what they do is they help educate the, um, the immigrant. They teach them English. They provide child care so they can search for jobs. Um, they provide, you know, the arts and all kinds of just basic needs and necessities in addition to that to try to, you know, really improve the lives of the settlement house workers. There's a great, great clip of Jane Addams that is um, is on the page here that I really encourage you to watch and look at um, about her. Okay, so my one thing that's really interesting, and we're going to get more into depth into this when we talk about the 1920s, but consumer freedom tends to really grow at this time. Department stores for the very first time, silent movies, Sears Roebuck catalog comes out in, in the late 1800s. That's like the Amazon of the time. And so it goes all the way throughout the country. People are able, no matter where they live in the country, to get all these goods and services that other people, they normally wouldn't have been able to get. Leisure activities for the very first time. They have carnivals. They have, um, you know, all kinds of things like that. And even baseball, right? Baseball, football, basketball, they all come about during this time. People, people are able to enjoy these kind of leisure activities. In addition to that, um, women begin to have, you know, greater roles in the economy also. So these traditional gender roles of just staying at home, they start to break down a little bit. Women are even permitted uh, that were married to start working, where this was, you know, there were many companies that absolutely wouldn't let a married woman work, and a teacher for a long time couldn't work because she was supposed to be a model to her students, and a married teacher shouldn't be working. That's what they thought, which is really weird, right? We think so. But at the time, that was the thing. 
but anyway, um, you know, working for them became like a sign of emancipation and freedom for them. And we'll talk more about that when we start talking about the flappers and everything like that in the 1920s. Uh, but the last thing I want to talk to you guys about is the rise of Fordism. So Ford, the car was actually invented in the late 1800s. But they were pretty expensive. Only people that were really wealthy could afford a car. And so uh, Ford creates the Model T, his Model T, in 1908, but it cost $850. And that, that kind of money at that time wasn't affordable for the average person. And he really saw it. His goal was to seek out creating a car that even the people that worked in his factory on the assembly lines, or there wasn't an assembly line yet, but, you know, the people in his factory could afford. And so he designed the moving assembly line, right? So he uses the moving assembly line, which all people use now to create manufactured products. But it, it increases the Model T efficiency so much that it goes from nine hours to make a Model T to one and a half. So the cost goes from $850, and with the moving assembly line and the more efficiency, knocks it down in nine years to 290 Now, everybody could afford it, okay? The other thing that he does that is really uh, instrumental at this time is he's the first person to allow, like, a five-day work week, reducing the hours, increasing the pay. He gives Saturday and Sunday off, which was unheard of. Most of them would have to work for a weekly salary, and they, they still did even with Ford, but he's only five days a week. A weekly salary, uh, Saturday and sometimes even Sunday in a lot of the other factories, and and, Lord, and, and Ford really changes that, okay? All right, so um, the next video clip is going to be on how politics changes, and a look at that in particular um, how, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, um, Taft, and Wilson, and the progressive presidents, how they changed things kind of politically during this progressive era.